Welcome to One Sharp Sword, cutting through to what matters most. I'm your host, Dr. P, Dr. Wayne Purnell, the Exponential Success Coach. And today I have with me Stacy Marmaleo. Now, Stacy's got an interesting story, and what she does is interesting. And it I will I'm gonna share something with you that is I was not sure about Stacy's story or what she's offering when I first read about her because, well, she's into franchises. Oh, no. Uh, and then it's something about her just struck me. And I was like, you know what? Maybe, just maybe, this could be interesting to all of us because I have a personal style of uh, it, I, I, as my TEDx talks about engaging a parallax perspective to disrupt perceptual bias. And I came at the idea of a franchise or doing franchises with this bias of, oh no, not franchises, but there's so much more to it. And so I thought I would explore it for me and invite you as my audience in with that Here's Stacy Marmaleo. Thank you for joining us on One Sharp Sword. Hi, Dr. P. It's great to be here. And I love the approach of the conversation that we're going to have because you are absolutely right. So many people think of franchising in the same mindset. They think of multi-level marketing or pyramid schemes. Oh, and yeah. There was a time way back, maybe the 50s, 60s, that that was the case. So they're old tapes that are playing in our heads, but they were very real several decades ago. And it was several decades ago. It's and and unfortunately for that, it is uh, it, it's it's like this generational genetic uh, <laughs> withdrawal from the idea of oh, not franchises, like the F word, <laughs> right? The F the F word. Yeah. That's funny. Uh, so. You didn't start. I want I always like to know about my guests. You know, you didn't you didn't start by uh you know jumping in and going, ta-da, I do franchises. And when I'm not doing franchises, I forgot to say this as part of the intro. When you're not doing franchises, you're doing educational work with veterans and their families. Is that right? That is correct. On okay. franchising. <laughs> on franchising. That's awesome. But so, it's on a volunteer uh, basis, yeah. That's so good. So we're going to talk about that. You didn't You didn't just uh, wake up one day and go, I know what I'm going to do. No. It's <laughs> all about franchises. Uh, so, so talk a little bit about your history. I know that you, just from before we started recording, you said that you'd uh, basically spent most of your life in the Minneapolis area. In the, Midwest. Uh, in the Midwest. Okay. And landlocked is really what it is. Yes. Landlocked. And then you chose to move to the East Coast where there's water, um, ocean, and ocean. Sunshine. I've traded the snow for the sunshine. <laughs> you, you have traded the snow for the sunshine. All right. Well, talk about where you grew up, how you grew up, what you were doing before you um, made your decision transition into doing the franchise world sure so my dad was actually in the military and i come from a 10 generation military family so that's my connection to the veterans um i was too my parents wanted me to join the military and i was too much of a rebel back then and i knew i'd end up in the brig or kicked out so <laughs> that wasn't really an option for me I wanted to be an entrepreneur from the time I was in college, but because of the 10 generational military thing, and my mother really sees security in military service. So she was very concerned, not only about me thinking about starting my own business, but in fact, following a even a corporate career path. So even though I wanted to be an entrepreneur ever since college, I did the safe route in my mind, which was the middle between military and entrepreneurship. And I climbed the corporate ladder in corporate America. And then when I was 45, I still had the itch to own my own business. And I ended up 
buying the business, the franchise, the way most people buy a franchise. And I'm going to tell you now it's the wrong way to buy one. Okay. <laughs> but what I did was my son was into music and he participated in a summer camp where they played a live concert on the Friday afternoon. And he stepped off the stage at 15 years old and said, oh, that was the greatest high of my life. And I'm just bummed. I have to wait a year to do it again. And I said, well, there's got to be someplace you can do this. And at the time there wasn't. So I went online and I found a music school and I called to see if they were having any more summer camps. And they said, no, but they were getting ready to sell franchises if I was interested. And so I flew out and I met with them and I just thought it made it sounded like a good, solid business. So I quit my safe, secure, well-paying corporate job to buy in three locations of this brand new franchise. I had no clue what I was doing. And that's how most people buy a franchise is they experience it. And then they're like, oh, that would be cool. I'd like to own one of those. Um, in reality, you're better off figuring out what your core competencies are, what you like doing during the day, and how much money you have to spend. And with those three keys in mind, then it's time to start thinking about what franchise you'd like. So I also think one reason that franchises get a bad name is people buy one, not really knowing what they're getting. Yeah. And yeah, I, did, you know, I got lucky. Basically. You, talk, you, you talked about what's known by some people. It's known as the entrepreneurial seizure, which is, I love this. I'd probably be great running it. And you step in and you go, oh, my gosh. Um, I have no clue what I'm, doing. I, I'm a business owner. Like now, what? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. The the good news is because uh, <laughs> because many of my audience listeners and and viewers are entrepreneurs. The good news is they'll relate to this. That most entrepreneurs start into the business going. I just really want to spread this because I believe in it so much. Mm -hmm. And they don't know all the pieces of what makes up a business. Right. That's an okay thing because, you know, we talk about it's not a failure. You just learn and keep going and learn and keep going. Exactly. The problem is that most new businesses, what's the statistic? Like 60% of new businesses fail in the first year and another 20% yep. fail within two years after that. So, And franchising, by the way, is no different. So there is a statistic online that a bunch of people selling franchises like to push out there that's like, you know, I, I'm making it up to illustrate the point, but like only 10% of franchises fail or some ridiculous number like that, right? And so that's part of the challenge, obviously, with going online for information is you, if you don't know what you don't know, you don't know what facts are accurate and which are inaccurate, so you know? True. So it's not that buying a franchise guarantees success because it doesn't. It's still, you still have the human element. And without the proper management and the pop proper employees doing the job, you're still going to have a problem. But the benefit of the franchise model is they hand you the playbook. So oh, if you did. follow the playbook, you should be successful. What happens is people get into it and they think they have they can build the better mousetrap. And so they start trying to change the way the franchise does things. And then that gets you in trouble with the franchise and that gets you disillusioned and it gets ugly. So if you go into it knowing you're managing, I mean, you own the business, but think about if, particularly if you're leaving a corporate position and you're managing a division, it's the same thing. Like you're going to make some decisions, but other decisions are going to be dictated to you by your franchisor. Amazing. Because that is like when you go into a business, if it's not your startup, then you are going into a business that somebody else has started. And in a franchise, it's double-edged, isn't it? They hand it is. you the playbook mm -hmm. play by these rules. 
that's good because you know exactly what it takes to make for success. That's exactly. bad because where where are you in the midst of it? You must right. play by these rules. Right. So, and it all depends on the franchise too, to be honest. Sure. It, my it's I don't have any statistics to back this up, but my belief is the more mature the franchise, the more they're going to dictate exactly how you do everything. Well, and and so that could be the appeal where, as well, right? Exactly, I mean, right. right? That's the, where the, risk assessment uh, comes in, right? The, the big burger places have been doing it for decades. They know the model that works. They know the uh, it's a business model that is that is based on making money. So you know, and yes. the franchise soar doesn't like they rely on on you as the franchisee to make money to make money so they're out actually to help make you profitable as well right um they are out to help you generate revenue okay they do not help you with profitability interesting so if you think about like your um pnl right they are going to watch everything that brings in money but what you spend your money on is 100% up to you. So it, it's one of the reasons why it's really difficult to look at any individual franchise shop and decide whether they're profitable or not. If I mean, as a conglomerate, because if you look at, like, say me, right, maybe I want to have my car be paid for through the business. Maybe I'm going to use my personal truck to drive because I own a music school. So to drive gear to a show, right? So I had a corporate vehicle. Well, obviously when you're paying for a vehicle and you're paying the insurance, that's going to come out. So you're going to see that on the bottom line, not as much revenue or not as much profit. Other people may not run their car through it. Some people have insurance for their employees and their family through their business. Some people do not. So there's a lot of expenses that are up to the individual owner as to whether they want to spend it or not. In my franchise, they required that we spend 3% of our revenues on marketing. But I tended to spend more because I came from a marketing background and I love marketing. So it was almost like an experiment or whatever, figuring out what worked. I just enjoyed it, right? So I spent too much money on marketing in the model. So that's why I say they really don't help you be profitable. They help you generate revenue. Okay. So for the, I mean, who's the target for a franchise? Like for the average person who's, and I don't know if any of my listeners would consider themselves average at all. Right. Um, because, you know, just because we're not. Well, <laughs> we're I was just going to say, I, dare I say, I don't think any entrepreneur or anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur is average because okay. it takes a lot to be willing to be an entrepreneur. So at what point do does somebody in a J-O-B job where J-O-B stands for just over broke, right? And they're, they're getting through day by day, week by week, month by month, uh, working for the weekend. And then they're like, hey, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be, you know, I want to be in charge. I, you know, I've put aside some money. Maybe I can invest in me. How does that work? Yeah, good question. Because in my generation, I'm 62. So in my generation, the target audience to buy a franchise was generally somebody who was in corporate America, who had climbed the ladder, had re uh, achieved some modicum of success, and then wasn't going to go any further and wants their own business, right? Mm -hmm. Today, there are so many, because it used to be before the internet, that franchises were pretty much brick and mortar stores, right? But now there's part-time, full-time, work from home, brick and mortar, online. It's insane. There are 4,000 franchise brands. So to go back to what I said earlier, which is most people experience a franchise and decide they want to own one. And I really prefer if people look at their core competencies. There are plenty of uh, online skill assessments 
And um, I use a couple of them with my clients, but we do a corporate, I mean, we do a competency assessment and then we do uh, what's called a motivator assessment. And I don't mean you're motivated by money or you're motivated by altruism, but like if you closed your eyes and figured out your perfect work day, what would it look like? What do you really enjoy doing? Can you imagine a job where you're in flow 10 hours a day? Where you're just loving every minute of it? That's the goal to owning your own business. That's what you want, right? We don't get in it to be as miserable as we were in the J-O-B. So it's really important that you know yourself and what you're good at and what you enjoy before you pick your franchise. I think, and, go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, Stacy. I think that that it's really important. You know, you said that. Can you picture yourself working ten hours a day and really enjoying it? And um, when I heard you say that, I'm like, why would I work ten hours a day? And then I realized I do own my own business, and I'm probably working at least more 10 than hours that. A day. Yeah. yeah. That it's yeah. and that it's not work. That it's like you know, I think about it, I write, I you know, talk to people, I coach, mm-hmm. I yeah, like I this travel. Right now. This is technically work for both of us. True. I'm yeah. thoroughly enjoying sharing a different mindset about an industry that's been around since the 1930s. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, and and what's interesting is my target market is similar to yours, and it is um, in in that people with success or a success mindset who who have accomplished something and know that there's more yeah. <laughs> know that they want they yeah. want more for their lives and it's like well cool i can help them get there and you know the franchise model what you're offering is is like well i, I can give them the thing that that I, could fill up their lives like i think it's the best first business to own because If you think about it, and and I've told this to to, to many, many people, but people look at a business, a franchise or any business, and they say, I want to own that, right? So let's say Chick-fil-A, because that's a hot one right now, right? You couldn't get a Chick-fil-A if your life depended on it, if you don't already own franchises and have millions of dollars, right? That's that's the big game. Is that what Um, they're looking at? So they, so franchisors are looking at your ability to oh make yes. That business successful. Yes, it's not just about if you have the money you can have it. They're vetting you as much as you're vetting them because if if you go rogue on them or one bad apple, that just kind of has the ripple effect on everyone else's business, you know? It breaks the brand. Yeah. I mean, yes, yeah, so think about when like Chipotle's not a franchise, but think about when Chipotle had the Listeria outbreak or E. coli oh, yeah. or whatever it was. Every Chipotle got affected by it, but not every Chipotle had the outbreak, right? Right. It's kind of the same thing when you own a franchise. But one thing most people don't think about, and I I really, I have to look right into your listeners. I I really want you to think about this. If you want to own your own business, you don't have to start with the golden ring. You can buy a small business that you can afford, just like you buy a starter house. You can grow it and you can flip it and you can take those profits and buy a bigger one. So you can have a path to owning a McDonald's or a Chick-fil-A if you want one. You're just not going to get it right now. Just like the, just like me and my, my house on the beach, right? It took me 40 years of working to get my house on the beach, but I had a little house and then I sold it and I got a bigger house and I sold it and bigger house. I sold. It's just, yeah. So if you want to own your own business and you can't afford what you ultimately want, start with something smaller, be proud of it, make it the best it can be and flip it. This is interesting because in my world, I talk about exponential success, right? Well, exponential success is often built on incremental steps those incremental steps are not insignificant. Like not at all buying a house and then selling it and buying a bigger house and selling it and buying a bigger house and selling it and selling it to move to your dream home. That's like, that is a huge exponential leap in your life. 
Right. And if I'd have looked at living here when I was in college or when I was 30, even, I couldn't have imagined it. Yeah. 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 You're in Florida now, which is but right it just makes you the smile. sunshine state it just makes me smile <laughs> that's awesome you know you are bigger than the life you are leading it really is time to attend to that thing you've wanted to do or have but you've been putting off it's time to step into that dream you've parked for someday it's time to claim true well-being both personally and professionally without giving up the success that got you here it's time to check out Dr. Purnell's signature small group retreat, the Exponential Success Summit. Explore ExponentialSuccessSummit.com. Seats are extremely limited as this is a very special small group event. www.ExponentialSuccessSummit.com. So where do we start? You know, that that's the big question yep. I would I would have is at at some so, point we go, uh, you said there's 4,000 franchise brands. You've mentioned the ones that I can't touch. Mm-hmm. Um, what is there, right? Yeah. So, so before I forget, I'm just going to throw a few nuggets out there that are going to be really important if anyone really is thinking about buying a franchise. And then we'll I'm talk about make notes. how to find one. Okay. So, so we talked about buying the one you can afford. That's number one. There are franchises for as little as $5,000. So one question, and again, this goes to that motivator thing and your mindset and what you like. Do you like being a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond? Do you like to fly under the radar or do you want to be the one on stage? And the reason I ask this is because if you think about it, let's say you've got $100,000 to play with. You're going to buy a business, you've got $100,000. And we'll talk about where you're going to get $100,000 in a minute. But got $100,000 to invest in this business. You could buy one franchise for $100,000. Or you could buy 10 branches of the same franchise for $10,000 each. That's the difference between being a big fish in a small pond and a small fish in a big pond. So, you know, earlier when we were talking about just following the playbook, if you become a big fish in a small pond, then the franchisor is going to ask you to sit on advisory boards and help them make decisions on where the business is going to grow. Because with 10 locations, arguably, you're probably one of the bigger franchisors in a $10,000 per unit franchise or franchisees, excuse me, in a $10,000 per unit franchise than many others. So you're going to have more say in the future of it. And it's going to be more of a partnership. If you are one of a thousand franchisees, you're probably not going to get much attention. Now, some people like to fly under the radar. So if you like that, you're going to want to look at a bigger, more, more established one. And another thing to consider is your risk tolerance, right? There are some risk assessments. You probably have one that you probably work with your, maybe your um, clients on. But what is your risk level? You know, do you want to go for a more established one or do you want to go for a startup? Because remember, the franchisor is a business as well. So he could or she, they could go out of business just as easily as you could go out of business. I mean, have you ever thought about that? You know, so it's all scary then, right? It is. It's, it's, but isn't business scary, Dr. P? Yes. Yes. So, yeah. So now that I've scared the heck out of you, let's talk about the positive sides of it, right? Yeah. So, the most, so it depends. Are you going into it? I say people go into business for one of four reasons, right? They either want fulfillment, freedom, Flexibility or money. Funds. If, if you funds. Are, yes. oh, that's a good one. Funds. Fun. Funds. I, as long as you're doing an F. F's, that's perfect. I love it. So run run it by. You've got funds, freedom, flexibility, or fulfillment. And that's also going to influence your decision. 
right? I will tell you, I initially stepped backwards in income when I left my corporate job to start my franchise. Can I just interject really fast? You sure can. I did a presentation for the New York, New York State Business Council's uh, HR division, and uh, I uh, it's a very you know kind of serious, very big business. Uh, uh, you know, it's a it's a group of business people that get together. Uh, think of like a chamber of commerce on steroids. You know, it's like uh -huh. this is the New York State Business Council. And I did this presentation and I talked about with the grand uh, resignation on the, on the, you know, in the wake of that, mm -hmm. what is it that people want? And I said, look, there are two main F words and that got people's attention. There are two main F words that people really want. One is they want flexibility. The other is freedom. And these are two of your four uh, mm -hmm. Because I think those lead to fulfillment, which is the third. Exactly. And, oh, by the way, pay me, which is funds, fund me. So, uh, exactly. yeah. Isn't that is, funny? We didn't know each other before today, and here we are with the same mindset. I love we have that. the same message in, yeah. in so many ways to different, to different, going different avenues, which right. is, which is so good. I think that that the other piece in here is. In one of the key things that most people want is to know that their work is meaningful. And so, um, you know, are you making a difference in the lives of the people you're serving? Exactly. And, and for me, that was more fulfillment was my reason. It yeah. was more important for me to bring joy to kids like my son I mean, if you, if you yeah, I'm going to go down a different path for a minute, but we're yeah, talking please. about fulfillment, right? So if you think about what you do day in and day out, and I made money for a, a privately owned international corporation, they made lots of money. It wasn't necessarily fulfilling. I mean, it was a joy to hit my budgets and like get, get promotions and, and whatever, but it wasn't every day I didn't go in thinking I'm making a difference in someone's life. Mm -hmm. And my son was bullied in school because he was a musician, not unusual, wasn't a jock, wasn't necessarily an A student, B student, but not, you know. So his his light shone on his musical ability. And in high school, that's not cool. And so kids tend to get bullied, right? So when I created this school of rock, that was their place. That was their safe place. That's where everyone was as weird as they were. You know, there's a reason Austin had the had the logo uh, or the the nomer keep Austin weird. Yeah, big music town. You know, musicians are proud to say they're weird or nerdy or whatever. Yeah, but they also want to feel like they belong. So to create this space where my own son and kids like him, their self esteem just skyrockets. And we would get letters from teachers, academic teachers saying, oh, my gosh, this child's grades have improved significantly. And part of it is because you learn through, or through music. But the other was simply self-esteem and believing they could do it. Yeah. And that was my fulfillment is really helping these young kids believe in themselves again when the world had beaten them down. I love that. I love that. So of the 4,000... Oh, sorry. So, yeah. So if we go there, so you're going to make the most money on the dirtiest jobs, right? So if you're doing this because you just want to make a boatload of money, buy like a junk hauling firm or buy a franchise where you clean up crime scenes. Those are really lucrative because there's not a lot of competition. And you personally don't have to do it. You can hire somebody to do it. Okay. Or one, I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh. No, one of, the, the, so the next one I'm going to throw at you, you're never going to believe me, but there's a company where you pick up dog poop. Oh, you know what? Our neighbors have one of those. It's they like, do. that's so amazing. That's like, like, that's like in, making money. In their that's, own yard. 
in right so that's really yes. funny to me like and like, and like, what you can do think yeah. about it now back in the day again boys used to knock on doors to mow lawns for neighbors they don't do that anymore but if you have a pooper scooper business you can hire the local teenagers you don't have to go pick it up and you know i don't know about certain areas but i can tell you in minnesota it's a very popular business because nobody cleans their yards all winter with 15 feet of snow on it. And so when the snow melts, there's quite a job to be done. After the job was already done. By After the job. the job was done. Okay. So anyway, so that's a pretty profitable small franchise that you can buy. Oh, all right. You, say you want to work from home and you want to work part time because you've got kids in school. Yeah. Right? You can own you can buy franchises that send people out to do different jobs, right? So again, your home office could be the base and you could have a plumbing company and you hire plumbers that work for you. And then you send them out. You know, you've got the trucks and they could keep the trucks parked at their house or you could, if you had a location, you could have them park them there, whatever. But then you send them out so you could answer your phones, say, you know, you could say my hours are Monday through Friday from, you know, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. or whatever. Phones so are in at that time. So in that kind of case, why franchise? Because you've never owned a business before and you don't know how to do it. And that's why I say I like them for a first business. And then you can decide. It's like getting a paid internship in owning your own business. That might be the quote of the, <laughs> of the episode. Really, seriously. Yeah. That's... No, but seriously, that's what it is. Yeah. It's a paid internship to owning a business if you've never owned a business. Yeah. This is, I mean, that's really a great way to think about why step into franchising? Well, if you've never owned a business, this is going to teach you how you get the playbook mm -hmm. and you're paying yourself to do it. Mm -hmm. And that way you can decide. And, and the other is that you can decide if you want to keep doing it or not. So one of the things we haven't talked about, but with franchising, you're signing a contract. And you don't get to just, like if you, let's say you wanted to start a coffee shop. And a year into it, you're like, this sucks. I'm working too hard. I'm not making enough money. I'm walking away. That's not an option. We're back to the scary stuff now. That's mm -hmm. not an option in franchising. You sign a, a commitment and you're on the hook for the commitment. Now, what you could do in that year mark, though, is sell it. Right? So some franchises, mo the, the most common terms are five years or 10 years. And then when you're looking at like a McDonald's or Chick-fil-A or those, it's like 20 years. Hmm. Hotels. I mean, do you know that hotels are franchises? You could buy a Hampton Inn if you had the money. Hmm. So yeah, once you start thinking about this, you're going to start looking and become so aware that pretty much every business in, in corporate America or in Main Street America is a franchise. It's insane. There are advertising franchises. There are real estate franchises. There are insurance franchises. There are insurance, yeah. food, child enrichment. I mean, education, daycare, doggy car, doggy car washes, doggy dog wash facilities, laundromats. I mean, it, if you can think of it, there's a franchise in it. If you own a business already and you're listening to Dr. P, you may want to think about if you want to turn your business into a franchise. Because that's a whole different part of the industry. That is. And you you know how to do that and you teach people how to do I know that. about this much on that side of the business. Okay. But I can refer them to people who do that for a living, yes. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. Amazing. All right. So Do you still hate franchising, by the way? I never hated it. Okay. My okay, so my style, I told you, my style is um 
if I have, and this is really important for, for my audience, if I have a reaction to something, that's about me. That's not about the other person. And so my style is to say, what is it that I'm missing? I assume that I'm missing something if I have this reaction. I'm missing something about the context of the situation. I'm missing something about the other person or I'm missing something about a blind spot that I have. That's the, so I would refer people back to my TEDx, which has close to 2 million views. I'm very proud of that. Uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, how a parallax perspective disrupts perceptual bias. We have biases. So if I'm like, oh, franchise, it's why you're here, Stacey. It's, it's, did I recoil franchise? I don't know if I want that on my podcast. Why not? Let's yeah. find out. I don't know enough about it to judge it one way or the other, right? I don't Love know. That. I'm so when we're finished, I have I'll admit I have not seen your TEDx talk, but when we're finished, that's what I'm gonna go do is watch it. Well, thank you. That's awesome. I'll be two million and one. There you go. Yeah, it's close to two million at this point. I'm really kind of excited yeah. by that. So Are you, and well, you should be. That's fabulous. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and it's funny that that you mentioned your like questioning about franchising. Yeah. And I'll tell you this story, and I it's, i don't know whether it's appropriate, but you can cut it out if it's not. It's, it's all appropriate. I don't think I've ever uh, cut anything out of a, out of this unless unless somebody is disparaging somebody else directly, mm. which has never happened here. I, I really, this is a conversation. It's what we do. Okay. So I I don't do much marketing. I do more public relations for outreach for my client development. And I reached out to Fortune Magazine and I spoke with the editor and she said, well, to be honest with you, we don't write about franchising. We just don't see it as a legitimate business. So you'll never see that's, And I think that that lends to that negative bias, right? Well, it, it, yeah, it speaks to it. Yeah, that it's that it's out there. That it's seen as so. Uh, there are eight million people employed by franchises in the United States. Hmm. I would think that those eight million people deserve some sort of recognition in in the what did she call it? She didn't call it the vintage media, and she didn't call it traditional, but it was something like that, right? So, like your Forbes, your Wall Street Journal. Fortune, you'll never see anything about franchising in there. Interesting, because it's not seen as uh, legitimate, uh, which which is interesting. Um, Four thousand of them available, and 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 that's just the franchisors. I can't remember the the statistic yeah. on how many franchisees there are. Yeah, four thousand brands. I want to say I want to say it's something like seven hundred and fifty thousand, but I wouldn't swear to it. I could probably look it up. But amazing, yeah. 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 Amazing. Well, okay. So what you do now then is to help people, what, decide? Right. So what I do is if somebody comes to me and they're like, I'm, I want to own my own business, I'm thinking a franchise might be in order. So we do the core competency assessment, we do the motivators assessment, we do a risk tolerance, and we do a financial. So we can see how much money you have to spend now. And then based on that information, we look at, well, then from there, we actually talk about franchising. Like, how are you going to buy your franchise? So, and again, this is like nobody told me, and I learned it the hard way. I took my 401k and emptied it. I remortgaged my house and I emptied my savings. That's how I bought my franchise. Right. So this is an interesting thing. You said the word spend and what I heard was invest. Okay. Yep. Because really what you're doing is you're, it is a gamble. Like anything you do, um, you are choosing to put money on something that you think will pay you back either in pleasure or comfort or dividends. Correct. And um, this is about you investing in you. Correct. I was betting on myself. That's yeah. 
Huge. I want to point that out because that's a big point for my audience. Like the you have to. You if if you don't invest your money in you, why should someone else invest their money in you? Or any energy or any attention. Exactly. That's the whole thing. You've yes. that's what coaching is about, is you invest in you to reach the next level of thinking so that people go, Oh my gosh, you've got something. Yes. You're different. And and when you're different, you are leading the way. And and the it's again, I mean, the message we're in two different worlds, you and I, Stacy. We're in two different worlds. And the message is very similar, which is you've got to invest in you if you want to get yourself to a new level. Right. Exactly. But you don't have to invest a hundred percent of what you need. And this is what I didn't know right? You need to spend, you need to come up with yourself about 30% of your total spend. And if you can legitimately bring 30% of your total spend to the table, then you can most likely get funding for the other 70. That's pretty good. Because the other thing is that the Small Business Administration has loans that are 100% dedicated to franchise buyers. And they actually, the Small Business Administration has a list of pre-approved franchises. So if you're looking to get a loan from the SBA to buy one of the pre-approved, then the processing time for that loan is going to be very short. The other thing to know is some people think that when you get a loan from the SBA, you're actually getting money from the SBA, but you're not. So what happens is you go to a bank for an SBA, you go to an SBA approved bank for an SBA loan, and it's actually the bank that's loaning you money, but the SBA is guaranteeing it to the bank. So if you default, the SBA is going to pay the bank. So you're not really getting your funds from the SBA, right? So there are two types of banks, and I'm sure Dr. P knows this, but I want to make sure your, your listeners know this. There are two types of SBA banks. So the first one is SBA approved. And what that means is they can process the paperwork, send it to the SBA for approval for the loan. The other is SBA preferred. An SBA preferred bank has been approved by the SBA to make the decision themselves on behalf of the SBA as to whether to give you that loan. So if you can go to an SBA preferred bank instead of an SBA approved bank, you're going to be dealing with the decision maker on site. Don't most towns have a small business administration or at least most counties do to be able to tap into and get a start? Yes. Yep. Yep. Awesome. And the other thing that's good about the franchise then is they generally have some sort of business plan that you can Mm -hmm. tweak to take to the bank as well. So you're not having to recreate a business plan either. I love it. And franchises, and if you think about it, when you go, if you go for a loan, a business loan, they're betting on you. If you go for a franchise loan, then yes, you're a part of it. But even more important is the history of the success of the franchise. So good. All righty. Well, let me ask you this as we kind of put a bow on this. I think this is great. And it's a really good place to kind of wrap this up with, you know what, give it some thought, get yourself to the SBA, have a conversation, but also reach out to you. So Stacey, if people want to reach you or to learn more or to work with you, Thank you. So I love conversations like this. So I could give you all kinds of websites, but if you're curious, I would love for you to send me an email to my personal email address and let's have a conversation. It's stacymarmalejo at gmail.com. And I'm sure Dr. P will put that in the notes so you'll have the spelling, but I'd love to hear from you. And again, let's just have a conversation if it's something that you want to explore. I know... I don't expect anyone to buy anything. I'm not high pressure. Just 
Yeah, I'm it's a conversation. I it's love it. I do yeah. want to, for those listening, I do want to make sure that you have the spelling so that you don't have to go to the show notes. Stacy okay. has an E in it, S-T-A-C-E-Y. Marmalejo is M-A-R-M-O-L-E-J-O. Stacy Marmalejo is uh, at gmail.com. And um and welcoming that's her personal email how often do you get that on this show so that's so great that's i so check great. it so much more than the work email i'm so bad at that so that's so funny um is there anything that i forgot to ask you or that you were hoping to dive into that uh, we didn't get to yet um no i think really you hit the main point dr p which is just to be open to it. If you want to own your own business, consider a franchise. It got me to owning an Oceanside home. And I loved every minute of the work that I did in my franchise. And I would love for you to love what you're doing too. And I think there might be a franchise that can help you do that. That's so great. I I love this as a as another quote. Um it's going in the show notes. Uh, and that is this, if you want to own your own business, consider a franchise. It's just that simple, right? So um, yeah, it's not a scary F word. I used to uh, talk about a four letter word that would propel me forward, four letter word ending in K. And uh, I I would put it on the door on the threshold of the door so that I'd see it as I I'd, I'd go out. And that was risk. Yes. That's okay. Risk. Just try something new. One thing new. So uh, for my audience, explore. It doesn't hurt to explore. Like learn. And and as you learn, you're going to go, wow, there could be something here. Or you know what? Interesting to know about. Not my thing. Either right. way, all good. It's your exactly. life. Exactly. You learn something. So exactly. you said that I, I I read that about you that you're a lifelong learner and you love learning, and I'm the same way. I yeah. the, the best thing that ever happened with the internet is courses, online courses. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, right. So, and that's part of what a podcast is, right? We get exactly. to drop in on others' lives and on others' uh, paths and go, wow, I could do that too, or wow, that's you know, good for him or her, but not for me. And uh, exactly. Cool. Yeah. It's All just it's fabulous. Yeah. All good. All right. Stacy Marmaleo, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Purnell. And thank you very much for the work that you do as well. I appreciate that. My pleasure. It's so funny to hear that. Dr. Purnell was always my dad. So I go, by, <laughs> I go by Wayne or Dr. P or Dr. Wayne or whatever, but there you go. I just felt like that needed to be like more formal, Doctor. Thank you. I appreciate. I do appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations All right. on the TEDx. Yay! Thank you for that as well. All right. Well, Stacy, thanks for being here. It was this, such my pleasure. Thanks so much. Truly good. This is one sharp sword. Stacy Marmaleo has been my guest. I'm Doctor P. Doctor Wayne Purnell, the Exponential Success Coach, and we'll see you here next time.